So it's 1986, my freshman year at the University of Minnesota. Walk Like an Egyptian was the big song, Ricky Foggy was the star quarterback, and Ken Keller was dropping half a mil on the East Cliff Mansion. By the time I arrived at the U, I'd been to hundreds of gopher hockey and football games. I'd seen legends like Tony Dungy, Tom Vanelli, Eric Strobel, Marion Barber, Neil Broughton, and Mike Ramsey play. Minnesota's Pride and Ice delivered some great games at the old Williams Arena against rivals like Michigan Tech, Wisconsin, and North Dakota. I'll never forget taking a date that fall to the Minnesota-North Dakota game to open the season. She said to me afterward, are these games always this crazy? To which I said, this was tame for a North Dakota game. The 86-87 Gopher team had a great season. They went 34-14-1, took second in the WCHA to that same Fighting Sioux team. Later that year, they lost in the Final Four to Michigan State on a fluky goal by Dave Arcoplane. The putt took an odd carom off the glass right onto his stick and caught Gopher goalie John Blue out of the net. But what stood out about that game more than anything was North Dakota fans at Joe Lewis Arena openly cheering for Michigan State the entire game, an image I'll never be able to erase from my memory. When I was a kid, if the home team lost, it hurt. But this loss hurt even more. I followed these guys through their youth and high school career. I played with Tom Chorsky his whole youth career. To see them lose on a cheap goal was brutal. A couple weeks ago, Chorsky posted a pic of the team on Twitter. This was no ordinary picture. It was kind of a team poster pic before there was team posters. But the picture says a lot more about our time of our lives then. There were no cell phones or social media. If you wanted to do something with someone, you gave them a call or you left them a message where you might be. It was a lot less complicated. This picture today would be impossible. Cheerleaders sitting on the lap of ladies' man like Dave Snuggerud, that would never happen. Today, the whole team would be in the picture. Seven guys are missing. Guys like Corey Millen, Todd Oakland, and Randy Scarra not in the picture, that would be a joke. Today, the lighting in the photo might be just a hair better. Well, there must have been a utilities budget at Williams at that time. Today, the roster is nearly half the size it was back then. Coach Wu had great success with walk-ons like Brett Strote, John Anderson, and Chris May. Today would be a marketing spin about the picture. This year's spin would have been only one more year until we get to play North Dakota again. But if you look closely at the picture, it has some priceless features. Here's just a few. The first thing you see is Tim Berglund, the guy with the headband. Don't lie, everybody sees the guy with the headband first. The current Thief or Falls coach is doing his best Jim McMahon impersonation. This is great stuff. I asked Chorsky afterwards if he wore a headband during the games. He says he'd never seen Berglund until he pulled this thing out of the archives. The next thing I saw was the Zamboni. How solid is that? Whoever set up the photo shoot was a genius to get that bad boy in the picture. After that, my eye heads right to the top of the Zam and you find team manager Jim Peliquin and former wild coach Todd Richards. You can't make this stuff up. From there, my eyes wandered immediately to the left of the guy wearing his bucket. It's Gary Shopek from Minneapolis hiding behind his mask. Rest in peace, Gary. Speaking of hiding, check out Lance Pitlick and Dave Granis going with the fro. Using the cheerleader pom-pom as a wig. Nicely done, boys. Ten points in hockey heaven for that move. My eyes dedicated an entire viewing to the cheerleader portion. Paul Broughton on the Zamboni seat with a cheerleader on the lap. I'm sure there's an NCAA violation in place because of that move, Polly. Or how about the Alaskan assassin, Steve McSwain, with the arm around the cheerleader? McSwain was known best for his hard work on the ice. Apparently he worked hard off the ice, too. And then finally, my good friend Dave Snuggerud who looks beside himself that a girl had sit on his lap for the picture. Come on, Snuggy, lighten up a little. It's a cheerleader for crying out loud, not a science project. A couple honorable mentions before I choose my favorite. I like the bookend mustaches from John Blue and Brett Nelson. Rumors both got jobs at Caterpillar after college. Or how every guy had their gloves on, as if they're saying, Look, Mom, I'm playing for the Gophers now. I got free maroon and gold CCM gloves. But my favorite part is how the photographer just knew he had to get the pretty boys in the front. Scott, Mr. Hockey, Bloom, front left. I had heard he'd wanted to wear a tux, but the guys wouldn't let him. Finally, Steve Orth, Marty Nanny, and Pete Hankinson. They called those guys the untouchables at the U back then, because when they walked into a party, no woman was safe from their beauty. And finally, Brett Strote and Dave Espy. They weren't pretty on the outside, but they were on the inside. Their record collection and aquarium was all they needed to be dangerous. So here's to you, 1986-87 Gophers. You made my first year at the U a blast. And thanks to Tom for helping me get this photo and my sweatshirt out of the archives.